have you sit down and you guys can. Sorry, we only have one mic here, but all right, we'll make it work. Thank you. Take some questions. Yeah, sure. We will. We'll give you. He'll. He'll. Yeah, he'll ask some questions and then he'll. He'll moderate a Q and A with. So, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Street, for all your kind words. And uh, um, I forgot and to read a passage from the book, but well, maybe we'll, 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 afterwards we'll let you do that. Uh, how are you? Uh, in the world of uh, foreign, you hold the microphone up? sure. In the world of foreign correspondence, you know, we don't meet everyone. I just wanted to tell you that some of my colleagues uh, speak very, very well of you, and that's really important. Um, Increasingly, as uh, Sri said, I've been involved since the day after September 11th with the latest of whatever is developed around the world. Um, increasingly, the face of war is in soldiers. It isn't um, people with guns. It's women. It's victims. It's, it's children. Could you address that in your travels and what you saw there as, uh, in the aftermath of the invasion, the occupation? Of course. The casualties of war are really the women and children, and, and the men. Um, the women in this book are mostly victims, and they're widows. There are one million war widows in Afghanistan. And this is not just this current war, but 30 years of war, as many of you know, starting with the communist coup, going into the Soviet invasion, um, and they have been battered. But at the same time, what I found was that there's this incredible resilience inside Afghanistan. Uh, I met a woman who's lost who, three sons in a rocket attack in Kabul during the Mujahideen era when the Civil War had broken out. She had two more kids left. And when she was telling me her story, she was smiling the entire time. And I looked at her and I said, how can you still smile? She said, because I still have two, two more kids left. Um, that, that's what inspires me in these places. Uh, I think the children, again, there, there are, when I, when I was growing up, there were beggars inside Afghanistan. It was, it was something normal. But this time around, when I went, they didn't spot the streets. They lined them. There were so many of them. These were orphans of war. Um, and, and a lot of women, as well, have become beggars. And in some cases, they've become prostitutes because they have to do what they have to do. Uh, there's a big trafficking ring of taking Afghan, young Afghan boys, taking them to the Gulf and turn, forcing them to become jockeys, camel jockeys. It, it's a very depressing picture. When you were talking, I was thinking of one of my favorite books by B.S. Paul, The Enigma of Arrival. And it was all about him going to England, this place that he had heard of. And, that he had never visited and living there for the first time and sort of identifying with the dream of the place, the ideas of what it was and what it actually was. How do you feel about that? What actually did you discover as opposed to what you dreamed about discovering when you first went back? Um, that, that's, that was my, one of my most intense subjects to have to deal with. I think I had two different points in Afghanistan. There were two stages from when I was born in 1973 during the monarchy to when the communist coup occurred, which was in 78. So I was five. And before I was five, all I remembered were, like, in Helmand, in, on the Helmand River, we would have barbecues. My family would have dinner parties. Um, this is co-gendered. It's not men and women. My father loved to have a good time. And we always had parties at my house. And I remember dancing. Uh, coquettishly to Afghan music as a child. I don't remember anything sad. Uh, as soon as the war broke out, things changed. And as a child, the first thing I can remember is the adults being very nervous. Nobody wanted to play with me. Nobody wanted to listen to me react like I am now. I, that was the first memory that I had. And then all of a sudden, there was this silence in the streets. Um, so we moved to Herat, where there had been an uprising, and uh, things changed very quickly. My school was bombed, and that's when my family decided that they had to leave. When I went back after 20 years, I wanted to go back to the childhood of those dinner parties and dancing and the greenery and my grandfather's orchard home where there were pomegranate trees. And we used to climb up those trees with my cousins. 
uh, mulberries are, are a very uh, favorite fruit in Afghanistan. What, what kids do is they take these big sheets and four children in the family will hold each corner of the sheet. And my uncles would go up on the mulberry trees and shake the branch and the mulberries would, mulberries would fall onto this sheet and they would put it in this huge round silver platter. And then all of us would gather and eat the mulberries. Those are the days I wanted to return to. And uh, you'll read in the book that that's not what happened. The first time I returned during the Taliban, um, your nostalgia comes face to face with reality. And often I had these epiphanies on rooftops because rooftops show this the stark nakedness of what has happened in a country that's been torn. When you're walking around the city, you don't really see much. The same thing happened to my mother when she came to visit me in Kabul. We stood on a rooftop in Quartier Parwan, which is one of the, the higher elevated neighborhoods. And what I saw in that scene was kids playing, and I still had a positive picture in my mind because I was comparing it to the Taliban time. My mother just started bawling when she was looking around because she had been to this neighborhood before and she saw the bullet riddled buildings, she saw how skinny the children were. So our points of view was so very different. And I think that that's a key point in, in, in this experience of exile and returning to exile and reconciling nostalgia. Well, thank you. You, you said some things about the negotiations now and about the current government and there are lots of opinions about the current government and whether it is positive or negative for the country. What did you come away with from thinking about the political situation given all that you saw there? Ambivalence. <laughs> um, it's such a complicated picture. Americans ask me, we're confused. Why is Pakistan doing this to Afghanistan? Why is Iran doing this to Afghanistan? Um, I had some knowledge of the country's history when I went in, but it was really a different experience to be on the ground talking to people and understanding their vision of things. Often it's not the truth, it's perception that shapes public opinion. It's perception that even shapes that truth sometimes. Uh, for example, if you go to Afghanistan right now and you're a Pakistani, you cannot say you're Pakistani and be safe. Because there's so much re resentment against the Pakistani government. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's directed at the people, but it's because of this government, the military establishment, and the ISI, Afghans are very angry. Um, and often, I've heard this several times, uh, well, if, do you want to be colonized by the US and Britain and the West again? No, but we don't want to be colonized by Pakistan and Iran either. If the US leaves, that's what's going to happen. We don't have the capacity right now to be completely independent. We are dependent on aid. So therefore, we need some kind of aid. We need some kind of backing. This seemed to be the opinion that I ran across um, from city to city. In the South, it's a bit different, where the Taliban have more support in, Tal in Helmand and Kandahar and Zabul in those areas. They believed that the Taliban were legitimate. Um, there was nothing wrong with them, then they should come back. Uh, because I think the way of life hadn't changed for them. They had been at war, they were still at war, they hadn't seen much development. Um, girls still couldn't go to school in those areas. So I think... I wanted to ask you a question about the follow-up on your uh, commenting about the girls who were sold into marriage and some of the things that were happening, there being thousands of them around. Um, I think one of the greatest underreported stories really are things that are happening to young girls around the world. And could you give us some, some more information about that, just how it works and how it's happening and what's being done to, to stop it? Nothing is being done to stop, very little, very little, because there's so many, the perception again is in the aid community as well as internally that women are a side note um, and, and young girls are, are a side note. Well, let the Taliban come back, but they're going to imprison women again. Well, security is more important. This is how the women's issue is always seen. And again, I believe that the women's issue needs to be included in the broader picture. 
um, we can't tokenize them, right? What, what, what is going on? I, I said there are many widows. I feel like Afghanistan, in many, many ways, is run by women, but people don't talk about that. Uh, they're not controlled by women, but the country, uh, there are six children to each family right now. That's the average family size inside Afghanistan. And it's women who take care of those families. Um, in fact, women don't have time to talk about politics often. When I would visit women, I would have to interview them while they were doing their daily tasks. And these are places, in these places where I went, there, there isn't any electricity, there's no running water. So any life itself is very difficult. Everyday life is very rudimentary. Um, so women are involved in that. But as far as the opium rights, there was a film that just was released. And you can actually see and visualize what I've written about. I had, didn't have anything to do with this movie, but I was fascinated by it because it's the current version of the book. I think this, this film was made recently. It was on Frontline, and it's called Opium Rides. And it show, shows you how these traffickers basically terrorize these families unless they give a daughter and sometimes a son. It's, it's I wouldn't say common practice, but it's not uncommon that boys are used um, and, and sexually abused and turned into dancers. Um, and women are turned into, forced to become prostitutes once they're sold into slavery or into marriage in these various parts. Um, so that, I know you have a lot of questions. I, I wanted to ask one more, and it's about opium itself, about poppy. You mentioned the interesting thing about trying, you mentioned that a lot of the money that's made goes outside of Afghanistan. And you also talked about the whole idea of reinvesting or trying to get the money and the profits to reinvest. Is that something that's realistic or is that something that it sounds very good? Is that realistic? And what would happen for that to be You mean reinvesting it into the country? Into the country yeah. of Afghanistan. It's, it's sort of, it is realistic and it's, it's happening, but it should be happening more. The idea is that there are these former, or, or there are drug smugglers who can be reformed. And I, I don't know how, how much reform they can be, but one of the men I'll talk about, he's a member of parliament right now. His name is Piron Pol, and he was an Uzbek from the north, from Tahar province. He, he clearly was a smuggler, but he no longer claims to be, because he says, I want to change my life, I'm tired of war. And the whole time I was interviewing me, him, he wanted to talk about how he could get his children to the U.S. so they could be educated, so they wouldn't be like him. So that, I, that there are a lot of these, these are actually former Mujahideen leaders who feel that they're tired and they want a better life and in order to have a better life then uh, they, they should give up crime. Uh, but I think it's going to be a long haul when it comes to the opium trade and solving the problem. The first thing you need is a government that can actually control its, a functioning government that's not corrupt, that's not involved in the opium trade. So it's a weaning off process. Has the uh, Obama administration uh, been doing much on the ground to sort of find alternatives to coffee yeah. growing? Yeah. yeah. The, um, there's been, there's been a, a certain, there have been several attempts made. Initially, the British were the lead on trying to, to fix this problem because Britain, 90% of the drugs on Britain streets is, it comes from Afghanistan. And most of you know that opium is refined into heroin and her heroin is the deadliest drug. Heroin, two thirds of the opium is now processed into heroin inside Afghanistan. That's what's changed in the last 10 years. What, so the British were very unsuccessful because what they did was fly in boxes of cash and give each farmer something like $350 a hectare to eradicate it. So these farmers eradicated their farms, and most of them are in debt before they even have a harvest because they have to get the, the seeds, they have, the seeds are loaned to them by loan sharks. So if they don't have a harvest, they're already in debt. And uh, most of the money that was given by the British was given to the local governors and the local police. And guess what they did? They pocketed the money. The farmers ended up not getting anything, they lost their harvest, and they fell into more debt. Uh, but that changed because once Holbrook was in, came and Obama came into power, they realized that the Taliban were using this money to find, fund their war against the United States. Uh, something to, from 70 to 500 million is how much they're making apparently. The numbers are sketchy. 
but they decided to focus more on alternative livelihoods, which means giving them alternative seeds uh, of lucrative crops like saffron, cumin, rose oil, Bulgarian rose oil, um, and then focusing on the communities that were hardest hit by this opium trade and providing jobs. That's also part of alternative livelihoods. Some areas have been more successful than others. In the east of Nangarhar, there are more poppy-free areas. But poppy, again, is a very resilient crop, and it's a business. When the prices of opium goes down, farmers stop because they have a stockpile, so they can sell those. They stop, uh, instead they start growing wheat. When the prices go up again, like they are right now, we might have read in the New York Times, it's gone up again, uh, then they start growing poppy again, unless you can give them something better. 